everyone, and welcome back to our deep dive into the lore of Final Fantasy XIV for beginners. Our two previous videos in this series tackled the ancient history and origins of our tale, as well as defined some terms and ideas from the game. But now, it's time for- Wait. I'm sure he didn't, but he didn't go to lengths of explaining Astral and Umbral and how they really work in a video for newbies, did he? I really hope he didn't do that, without heavily prefacing that with spoiler alert. He put a spoiler cutoff. That's a wild... Okay, he kept it vague? Okay. ...or the story. So sit back, relax, and let me regale you with the story of Final Fantasy <laughs> NyQuil? <laughs> a fucking bottle of NyQuil! I'm still confused with Astral and Umbral energy. Think of it this way. Astral and Umbral are like a positive and negative charge on other elements, but they can also exist as wholly um, astral and umbral representations. For instance, the seventh umbral calamity was an astral calamity, a, co a combination of many different powers and forces that essentially, if I'm not mistaken, gives rise to what is essentially pure astral energy, right? Pure, positively charged... Positive, positively charged? Oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck! Positive, positively charged? Anyway, the point is... Positive, positively? Umbral? Yeah, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Astro's activity, positively charged, right? Okay. And then umbral is basically passivity, right? Negative charge. And in this way, light is like a... is like a pure manifestation of the, um... of the... Because... <laughs> fuck, dude! Astral is darkness, right? And umbral is actually light. It's stasis. Right? Was we had them backwards. Were you checking the diagram? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have it on the wall. It's right there. It's right there. But I can't remember if it's post, but I can't remember if my if my um what's fucking me up is I can't remember if my poster is post Shadowbringers or not. <laughs> so I can't remember if it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like looking at it, I'm like, mm, mm, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, the idea is like, it's, it's like polarity of forces that can also manifest as their own individual forces. It's much like the light and void in World of Warcraft. Um, except those are considered less of polarities, even though I really think they are very similar to polarities. But they're basically like, they're basically powers that are connected with and affect the elements. Umbral should be darkness though, because umbral means shadow. I'm, I know that. I know that. Umbral should be darkness, but umbral. That can't be right. That can't be right because the seventh umbral calamity was an astral calam. It was actually an astral calamity, but it was darkness, wasn't it? The whole Bahamut calamity, that's like a big part, I think, of of Shadowbringers, isn't it? Where they like are talking about how it was an astral calamity. Nah, that was light? What are you talking about? So astral so oh, so astral is light and was Bahamut. But what we found out was that astral, whereas we thought it was for um, change, it, it was the opposite. Astral ended up being passivity, and umbral ended up being activity. Astral equals darkness, umbrals equals light. They're just misnamed based on our incorrect interpretation of it, so they need to rename the fuckers. Bahamut was astral and was darkness. Right. So we had astral and umbral... Con flipped. And that's that was the big revelation that Orianger came to let us know at the start of Shadowbringers. He was like, so I've been studying this, and it does not appear to be the way that we thought it was. I think it tracks actually with the way the seventh affected the environment. That's change if I've ever seen it. Yeah, darkness, astral, change, uh, light, umbral, passivity. And it's not necessarily that the term astral and umbral are correct, but that they should be inversed where the umbral 
right? The, 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 the word doesn't match what you associate it with, right? A realm reborn. So, so all elements can be astral or umbral if I understand properly? Yes. Oh, you're probably saying, Jesse, how on earth are you going to cover an entire MMORPG story in a short and concise way that won't waste hours of our time? Well, while 1.0 is the introduction to many of the characters we know and love, Shrek. it really was the tale of two Imperials, Nail Van Darnus, the White Raven, and Gaius Van Belsar, the, the Black, Black Wolf. Wolf. If these two seem like some pretty scary guys, they should. They're some of the best the Empire, Empire has, and the one spearheading. Hell, <laughs> Wombat, thank you. As I mentioned in months. the previous Appreciate history that. video, 50 years prior to the start of A Realm Reborn, the Garleans began their rise to power and conquest of the world, culminating in the great victory over Alamigo. And it was the competing visions of these two men on what to do next that would decide not only the fate of Eorzea, but the world. You see, the Garlean Empire's first conquests were the nations of the East, and it was there they learned the awesome power of the Primals, these summoned magical beings that we discussed previously in another video. These primals inflicted so much damage to the war effort that it became the primary goal of all future Imperial campaigns to prevent their summoning, especially so on the now opening Western Front. It was this fear that drove the Empire. How do we defeat our enemies when they have access to magics and powers that we do not? It's what drove their technological advancements and tactical decisions. It's what sparked their desire to unearth the secrets of the long-lost Allegan Empire and derive any advantage they could from them. And the result was Project Meteor. This is where Nail Van Darnus is. So comes Final in. Fantasy, a dude. Man, <laughs> I a love descendant it. of one of the Empire's founders and commander of the Seventh Legion. He was, in fact, so ruthless that he drew the attention of the Emperor. But the Emperor's interests were much deeper than his commander's skills. It was reported that Nail's family history stretched all the way back to the Allegans. And again, if you need a refresher on them, go check the History of Heidelin video. So to the south, deep in the heart of Bajia, the Empire began testing Allegan artifacts donated by House Darnus. With the knowledge that long ago, the hey, Allegans look, it's Azeroth. found a way to... <laughs> <laughs> Deep in the heart Check it of out. Raja, it's the, the Empire it's the began world testing soul. Allegan artifacts donated <laughs> by House Darnus. With the knowledge that... In the Titan Rings. Hey. Long ago, the Allegans had not only found a way to deal with the primals, but also defeat them. And the Empire, through this, discovered Same that color Talibut, of the smaller second Thirty red minutes, moon, cool. was in fact not a celestial body, but an ancient satellite of Allegan creation. That's so cool, dude. It's gonna be, end up being the same thing in World of Warcraft. Mark my fucking words. The moons and the sun and stuff in World of Warcraft are more than just like moons and suns. They're definitely they're definitely uh, tools, constructs, things like that. I'm pretty sure gateways, giant celestial alignment gateways. So it's it, it's not gonna be surprising to me at all if they end up revealing in WoW that like our orbiting celestial bodies are also crafted by our version of the Allegans, which we don't really have a one for one, but. <laughs> We have something pretty similar. A powerful weapon to unleash on Eorzea. However, just- Dalamud is the name of, of Menfina's pet. That is correct. Days before the plan's approval, the program's chief scientist, Midas Nan Garlin, began his attempts to contact the satellite to confirm their theories, which were almost immediately proven true as the immense power trapped within the satellite for 5,000 years pretty cool. was unleashed on Baja unleashed on Baja, destroying the city, the research, the Empire's top scientists, and countless Allegan artifacts and records. And that seems like it would have been the end for Project Meteor, with the Emperor losing interest in a power he couldn't control, but not for Nail. His house would not be shamed. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, and he got, in Eorzea... What do got, they call that? Tempered. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, in Eorzea... Gaius Van Belsar, Legatus, or high-ranking general of the 14th Legion and man responsible for the fall of numerous cities, took control of Alamigo. With the Empire's major military threat in Eorzea conquered, things should have proceeded without trouble against the weaker remaining city-states. But repercussions of the failure at Bajia were far-reaching. 
Midas Nangarlan's son. This is a great video, dude. Having this, like, broken down in this way. Like, I feel like I'm learning shit. Like, I feel, and I'm, like, realizing and remembering pretty key parts. Like, the Garlean Empire was, for all intents and purposes, prepped to fully conquest and take over everything on this continent. And, and everything around it. It's pretty wild when you think about, like, you know, having not played 1.0, which was all about Meteor Project, I don't, I never got to experience that. So everything I hear about it from Sid and all them is just, is just like secondhand, right? Didn't get to see it myself. So it's really cool to like think about it being Gaius versus Van Darnus. It paints Gaius in a much different way, right? At least, you know, a little differently. It sets up what we experience in A Realm Reborn very well, I feel like. And we're only four minutes in. That's crazy. How, how, yeah. Like, the timeline is something that I think I've just forgotten, having not played in so long or really talked about it too much in, in, in so long. So it's really good for me to hear. Sid, and one of Gaius's wards, a brilliant mind in his own right, defected to the Eorzeans with the knowledge of what horrors the Empire was prepared to unleash on the world in the name of conquest. Boy with said. one of the greatest scientific... I always forget that he's Garlean. <laughs> Of the Empire. I don't know how I could uh, how I could forget considering his last name. They're now gone. Sid Garland. <laughs> Come on. Like mm. on and with him untold knowledge of their plans, Gaius pushed ahead with his invasion, one that would surely make any aid Sid could provide moot and finish off any Aorzian resistance swiftly and completely. Alec. He would launch the entirety of his fleet at the heart of the continent, Mordona a place not only located centrally between all the city-states to cut them off from one another, but also the nexus of all the ethereal energies of the realm, seemingly flowing into the nearby Silver Tier Lake. To the Empire, this was a land of little more than strategic importance, but to those who lived on the land, it was a place of magic and mystery and great power. Gaius, fearing his enemies might use this ethereal energy to summon primals or in some other way draw the Empire into a long and bloody conflict, chose to ignore the legends of the land, the tales of this mysterious place's power. One such legend being the tale of the lake's guardian, the father of all dragons, Midgar Somer. As cool. legend would have it, long, long ago, the father of dragons Oh, was when you think about the Well of Eternity in Midgard Somer as well, that's like Well of Eternity, Yasharaj, Silver Tear Falls, yo, like, Eternal Steward type shit. That's interesting to think about. The giant serpent, which was it, which was in the Well of Creation, potentially. Huh. ...was made the guardian of the lake by the Twelve. Or the ancient what caused it, you know. ...pantheon of gods and protectors... Not in this case, but in ...that we discussed wow. in a previous video. And now the Empire would learn... ...from outer space as well. were true. True. ...with the full force of the 14th Legion bearing down on Silvertear, the Guardian surfaced. Summoning forth his dragon mm. children, he laid waste to the Imperial airships. No, no food for you, his Jay. his body around the capital ship... He brought it down. Sir, your production isn't high enough. No, no lunch for you today. <laughs> <laughs> to the earth, scattering the You're going to have to unionize if you want that. 14th Legion. The Empire was routed. But as Midgar Soma roared with triumph, the ceruleum fuel cells in the fallen capital ship ignited, destroying it, Midgar Soma, and in a brilliant flash, turning the lands of Mordona into a crystallized wasteland. Gaius had been defeated. And I'm just going to say it, bro. That is clearly, in my opinion, that is clearly energy emanating directly from the lake. That's not just an explosion. That is the, that's the lake like activating or doing something like that. Ain't no fucking coincidence right there. That that's, this is almost like a weapon being fired, which is pretty sick. Gaius had been. That's, that's pretty wild. That's like a huge beam of potentially etheric light coming out of the well. Activating to contain the destruction? Maybe? Or maybe it's Heidelin channeling through it as a way of like, I don't know. Remember when the summoning happened for the Ragnarok? I don't. Yeah, it's right here.
Holy shit, it is the same. It's like the exact same. Yo, that's crazy. Damn, bro, it's like exactly the same. That's crazy. What the fuck? Been defeated. Not by the armies of man, but by totally un Holy shit, it's literally identical. That's crazy. And the icon shooting out. Oh my god. Unexpected for Wow, that's crazy. It's like shot for shot, almost the same. That's so cool. Watch the 1.0 cinematic. It's a direct reference. I mean, that's what we're watching. Out of Heidelin's crystal energy. Formed by the Allied Society's Dynamis with Loperit creation magics. That is what we did, isn't it? I kind of forgot about that. And then primals appeared from that pillar. When we used all the icons to use Heidelin's ether reservoir to go to Ultima Thule. Damn, what the fuck? Dude, that's so cool. I think it's just ether exploding. Mmm, I don't think so. I think it's a little more than that. I've seen ether explosions, I think. Other ones before. This is very specific. Of course, his hubris leading to an imperial retreat back to Alamigo. It could just be how lots of ether exploding looks. I don't know, dude. It's directly tied to Heidelin. And, and, and I can easily connect Heidelin to Silver Tier Lake, right? We just spent the last 30 minutes doing that. I don't know if it's just ether exploding, you know? This seems like almost like a pretty specific invocation of, like, power. The way that it's identical is... I don't know. I don't usually think when things are identical, I don't think they're coincidental, typically. Gaius had been... And so it doesn't have to be a coincidence. They could intentionally both look that way because it's ether exploding, but... I don't know. Does that make what happened in Charlene with the Allies something like an artificial silver tier lake? That's kind of what I was thinking is like, how did they, so how do we do this out of the center of Charlene? Like, that's kind of crazy. Not by the armies of man, but by a totally unexpected force. His hubris leading to an imperial retreat back to Alamigo and a halt to their invasion. Not only did this defeat serve to embolden- Oh the wait, I forgot about the Aetioscope. Yeah, yeah. That was a- uh, The Ant Tower wasn't even at Silver Tier. That's correct. Still did well for the old Charlene colony. Yeah, was the Anti Tower- Or the Aetioscope? Wasn't that in Charlene or something? Yeah, it was like deep down, right? It was in the inner- You went down to Labyrinthos and then- No, is that- Is that right? Yeah, right? Then you like took an elevator and you went even further down under the Ragnarok and then it was like a facility that you like walk into. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's where it came from then. It's when we did all that stuff. And that was in the Ethereal Sea. So I feel like the implication is that Silver Tier Lake connects to the Ethereal Sea. <laughs> Remnants of the 14th would set about constructing a Whoa. massive fortified barrier to hide No, you can't swim behind, in the lake. Known as Belsar's you Wall. You can't swim in, the, in, in uh, Silver it, Tier. They would wait for an opportunity to present itself. And it appeared that that opportunity would be grasped by another. Nail, still reeling from his failures, seeing the war effort stalled, caught the ear of the Emperor once more, with claims of mastering the ability to control the Allegan satellite. Or maybe that and is how so on just, his yeah. orders, the Emperor authorized the renewal of the Meteor Project, giving Nail and the 7th Legion complete control over the 14th and Gaius and the Imperial. But at this point, and he's going to get to this. Nail Van Balesar was... Was tempered. Nail Van Darnus, pardon me. Pardon me. Imperial war effort. Eorzea would fall, no matter the cost. All was not well with the city-states, however, as their victory over the Empire would have its own grim consequences. 
the Beastmen tribes who before were a nuisance had now become a major threat. The Charlians, who had insisted on maintaining a peace, brokering deals and neutrality, and who for some time had maintained a colony on the Eorzean mainland, would finally abandon it, its scholarly inhabitants returning to their island homeland in order to avoid what was sure to be more bloodshed. Ishgard, the theocracy to the north, would pull their forces back to continue their unending war with the dragons, who were now without their progenitor, Migrasomer. And soon, even relations between Ulda, Gridania, and Limslominsa would sour. The Eorzean alliance existing now in merely... <laughs> nice animation there. Looks at Tural. <laughs> ...name more than function. It was in this time of uncertainty that the Adventurer's Guild was formed. A way to give former soldiers and those with the taste for the dangerous a role to play in this new Eorzea. This is finally where you come in. An adventurer seeking fame or fortune or maybe just a little fun. But this is Final Fantasy, so you know that won't last long. Because back in Charlian, talented mage and distinguished scholar, Louis Soir Levelier, and a collection of his pride. I don't know about some of the. I guess it's been out long enough, but like. Maybe just to little... use this shot in a lore, in a lore video for beginners Fun. is so this... painful for me. Like this Final Fantasy, so one of the know, coolest that... things about it was that it you like you got it. I don't know, bro. I don't know, I don't know. Won't last long because back in Charlian, talented mage and distinguished scholar Louis Soir Levelier and a is. collection of his prized pupils, scholars who had gained the title of Archon, would it's form... an it's a recap. So I think the it's implied that people probably wouldn't have been paying attention anyway, or like lore for beginners, right? I guess, I just don't know. I don't know. The Circle of No, a secret group that would oppose the Charlian Forum's non-intervention and set out to save Eorzea, yeah, yeah. not just from the empire, but from something far worse. Well-versed in ancient legends, Louis Soi was aware of the prophecy which foretold of the coming of the seventh Umbral Calamity. For more info on what the calamities are and how bad they can get, see the previous history video. Working behind the scenes, Louis Swa dispatched Thancred Waters to Ulda, Yishtola Rule to Limsa Lominsa, and Papalimo and Yida to Gridania, in order to convince the city-states to take the offensive to the Empire. Now, if that sounds kind of familiar to those of you who have played A Realm Reborn, it's because it's roughly the same thing over again in that game. You meet all these characters in the same places, roughly trying to do the same thing, I just noticed that symbol up above her head. The same thing over I know it's the Scions of the Seventh Dawn, again, but I never that noticed game. that the banner the hanging above Minfilia depicts a sun. And it's got 12 rungs to it. It's got 12 rays that come off of it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's not an accident. All these characters in the same Also circle of knowing. True. This is roughly trying to do the same thing. 12 They're archons, just... makes sense. It's, oh, that, I think that, oh, that is the circle of knowing symbol. Isn't the office also called Solaire also? There's like subtle hints about the sun as M shit throughout the whole fucking game, dude. That's crazy. Reintroduced to you all over again. So we're not gonna deep dive into all of that here. We'll save that for That's the cool. Realm Reborn video. The solar, yeah. Now, having said all the that, there's actually theme? one yeah. thing I really should include right here that will definitely come back in a Realm Reborn, but for our purposes, it starts right here. And that's the Echo. The Echo is a gift or a curse, whatever it is, it's something that began to appear after Because the they bear the legacy of Louis Swahu who summoned the 12 to stop Dalaman, right? Well, there was also the 12 Archons as well. It so I think it, it kind of all ties together. The warrior of light was the little real the real little sun all along. <laughs> what an irony that the scions have disbanded for Dawn Trail. Mm -hmm. Wolf Silver Tear Lake. Those who were granted the echo bear witness to a star shower from a burning sky and hear a mysterious voice calling to them. They're granted the memories of others and disturbing visions, none of which they have control over when it happens or how it happens. A great example can be seen early on in the 1.0 trailer where the main character is suddenly whisked away while talking to his friends. Then, after the vision ends, is right back where he was. So the Silver Tier Lake thing, the Ragnarok launch, and the 1.0 cinematic, because he's looking at that card, 
all depict that event. That's fuck similar, you know, similar ex ex exp expulsion of energy. That's to be fucking clear, this crazy is an to me. Incredibly rare thing. There are other characters you'll meet in the world that have it, but it is very few. This is where Min Look at how the light is shining down on our fucking head. Are you kidding me? Philia, who we'll meet That's again funny. in A Realm Reborn, comes in. Her role in 1.0 is as the leader of a group who attempts to... Wait, is that the... Is that the... Wait a second. The gear that Ardbert wears is 1.0 warrior gear? Bro, I'm cooked, bro. <laughs> and 2.0? Wait, what? <laughs> How did I not know that? I'm sure someone in chat told me that. That's, I'm sure multiple people did. But I didn't. I don't think I knew. I don't think I knew that. Dude, that's fucking sick. Support and it's class artifact gear. It's the warrior artifact gear from 1.0 and 2.0. Tech those. That's crazy. Affected by the echo. But if again, you notice, the entire party is the same as in the first. That I did notice. Yes, yes. I just didn't realize that the player that what you play in the game <laughs> is like that, but it's dyed black. Okay. This is where Minfilia, who we'll meet again in a realm reborn, comes in. Her role in 1.0 is as the leader of a group who attempts. Sorry. I remember when you started playing Fxif, and now you're ahead. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a long, it's been a long time. It's been like three years. Um, and yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Cabraxis. Thirty month resub there. And I appreciate that you're that you're still watching. All five warriors of darkness are class artifact gear. All right. To support and protect those affected by the echo. But again, we'll meet her and all the other archons and talk about the echo again in a realm reborn. Now back to the story. While the others ventured to the city states, Urian J traveled to the countryside, spreading the word of the dark prophecy far and wide. And while it earned him some contempt because no one wants to hear about the end of the world, it was secretly a plan to draw the attention of the empire. If they were to pursue this heretical doomsayer, it would draw their eyes away from Louis Soi's other plans. One of which was to figure out what the beastmen were up to and why they were summoning primals and more importantly, how they learned to do it in the first place. Enlisting the help of the students of Aldesian, another group of scholars from Charlian to research the primal phenomenon, we learn that summoning primals requires a vast amount of ether. Ether being the essential building block for all magic and life and using it in such high quantities, they would begin to drain it from the world itself, leaving the planet devoid of life. And for some reason, they were being taught to do this by a secretive group called the Asians. But we're basically like pseudoscientific ritual sacrifice that the Asians put into play essentially because they can't comprehend the whole dynamis thing and like how to handle their emotions and stuff. It's a very common trope in fantasy where like the gods or the original, you know, the ancients or whatever in the case of like Hermes, for instance, they didn't understand how to confront or, you know, how to handle these things or how to be open about it or confide in one another, right? It's like their divine flaw, right? that basically causes them to like cause catastrophe. <laughs> and it, that's why it comes down to like the less magical beings and those who are more susceptible to the influences of emotion and, and things like dynamis end up having to be like the save, you know, the saviors, the ones to figure it out because the gods magical and, and wondrous as they were the ancients in this case, you know, the hyper ethereal beings that once existed were, were also flawed in that, you know, while they were immortal, or until they decided that they were done, um, you know, they they were emotionally, uh, you know, not developed like what 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 you know lesser etheric being etheric beings are. So they had such dense ether dynamis might as well not have existed to them, so they wouldn't notice it, right? And so, but the thing that we learned is that dynamis actually makes up more of the cosmos than ether, right? And so the truth is that the ancients were kind of, in a way, they were kind of inherently blind to what what was happening to them, obviously that they, they couldn't even perceive of it because their bodies and their makeup and their very being was too etherically charged for dynamis to interact with them. And so what that goes to show you is that the cosmos is not just made up of matter and ether and science and things that can be experimented with, which is very much what the Asians or sorry, the ancients did hence the Asians, hence the Alligans, hence the Garleans and so, and so, so on and so forth but that the importance of emotional balance and connectivity to emotion is very important. 
Um, and then obviously you have the 12 and that whole storyline really reinforcing that concept of like faith and emotion are what drove our creation essentially and, and our growth. And without you, which the ancients or Asians may have considered lesser beings, we couldn't have even got to the point that we are at. So the truth is really that like there's a lot of power that lies in the faith of lesser beings as they as the Asians saw us, like, like I keep saying. And the fact that it does make up such a miraculous portion of the cosmos, such a large portion of it, I think implies that like, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously something we're going to explore a lot more in the future. And, you know, emotions are heavily tied to things like memory, to experience. And, you know, so there's, 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 I don't know, there's a lot of different ways that you can take that. And so, you know, memory crystals are a big theme with the Asians and stuff as well. So we'll see how that goes. But I just think uh, it's cool that like, what they're trying to say, I think, is that like it's important to be like in touch with emotion and how that affects the world around you or how you perceive the world around you as a result or those kinds of things. It's it's just important. So it's, you know, that's kind of the way I see it. We're going to stop that line of inquiry right now because I'm going to keep it cryptic. Like I said in the last video, while the men of the Empire and Eorzea wage wars, there are those in the shadows who are up to no good. Anyway, moving quickly along. While the Empire hid behind Belsar's wall, the Archons would not only try to warn the people of Eorzea of an impending calamity, but also try to impress on its leaders the importance of stopping the Beastmen and a potentially worse threat. Backing the Archons in their endeavor was Sid Garland and his new advancements in technology given to the Eorzeans after his defection. He would be indispensable not only in this, but in the coming days, knowing of Neil Van Darnus' desire to bring down Dalamid. So your adventurer goes from aiding the people of the city-states to joining with the Circle of Knowing in an attempt to stop the Beastmen before they Holy do too shit. much damage to the world. And although you overcome one of the tribes and their Fire Lord Afrit, perched above the battle is the White Raven's airship. The Imperial having observed your struggle, entreating you to speak with him, Nail warned of a threat that loomed over not just Aorza, but the Lamb. entire world. That's what Eorzeans didn't understand. The Empire merely wanted to save the savage nations of the world, unite them under one banner, and protect them from the same prophetic danger that Urian Jay spoke of. But you're the hero, so no way were you interested in listening to a most villainous monologue, and you told that guy to go kick rocks. Which, in hindsight, probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. Nail unleashed a mysterious dark power, rupturing the ethereal currents, saturating the area with ether. And although you managed to survive, in one fell swoop, Nail has made all of your efforts futile. Damn. The Beastmen now have access to more ether than ever before. Ifrit would return, and perhaps stronger than ever. But this action baffled Louis Swa. Why would a soldier of the Empire do this? Their whole objective was to stop the Primals and prevent their summoning. Surely this went against the Empire's entire reason for the initial invasion. It was Sid and his team at the Ironworks who discovered the truth. The Aether of the Realm was in chaos. No longer did it flow towards Silvertier Lake like it had done in the past. Now, just like in the days of the Allegan Empire, it rose skyward towards Dalamud. The situation became more dire with the discovery that the Empire had secretly taken Mordona while you were dealing with the Primals. A group of Alamegan resistance fighters seeking revenge decide to attack. And wasn't the whole point of the crystal, not the whole point, but one of the major points of the crystal tower was to um, redirect and siphon the energy to Dalamud. Doesn't it connect to Dalamud or some shit like that? It's like a direct siphon to it. Yeah. The Imperial position at Silvertier. That explains how Bahamut was so insanely powerful. Like... Because we just got finished earlier talking about the etheric properties and, and value of a place like Silvertier Lake. You know, obviously, that is an outstanding amount of ether that you could send to the to the primal in the moon. I mean, that is, you know, that makes that makes more sense, right? It is 5,000 years. Yeah, safely siphon and focus the energy from Dalamut so it can be distributed to the entire empire. Oh, it was the other way around. That's right. Wasn't it Dalamud was, like, said to be capturing the etheric rays of the sun or something? And then they could siphon from it some shit like that. So I think I, think I have it backwards, but it's it could have been cyclical in nature anyway or something like that. It was draining the energy of Bahamut? Uh, yeah, 
yeah, but Muhammad ended up super fucking strong because of all the fervent prayers of the devotees that were there, right? So that they were using him as a battery, right? They weren't, they weren't, in a way, Muhammad was, it, it was Muhammad was self-sustaining because of the, the prayer of those also imprisoned there. And then they were, yes, they were using that as, as continual power source. They basically imprisoned a god and used it as a battery. That's very, you know, never heard of that before. <laughs> Titans. <clears throat> um, so yeah, okay, okay. Free ether estate, that's right. I had it, I had it the other way around that they were like channeling from the, from the, uh, the lake to, but it was, I think it's the other way around that they were using the tower, like you said, as a distribution point. And steal an airship, thinking it relatively unguarded. Tempered dragons kept Bahamas sustained, right? Alligans drained Bahamut. The spears in the moon also helped with sustaining him, right? Upon arrival, the entire force is killed. And you come face to face with Gaius, now serving under Nell. More Jonah had in fact doing? become a staging ground for the final phase of Van Darnus's plan. What's Hildebrand doing? A lunar doing? transmitter, a way to... While you, in the circle of knowing, work to unite the city-states for an attack on Mordona, Nail, and the combined forces of the 7th and 14th legions. They would once again create the grand companies of old to fight on behalf of their people and unite to take on this threat. But this enemy would seem insurmountable until a gift was given to the Eorzean Alliance from an unexpected source. An Imperial airship making its way to Mordona would be shot down and with it, critical information on board about Nail's plans, his defenses, and more. After its recovery, Sid realizes it was Gaius who shot down the ship and allowed huh. the information to fall into your hands. And with that, the Alliance launched the attack on the Imperial Stronghold, where you once again meet Nail, who is now completely out of his mind. The Imperial General oh, seemingly yeah. referring to the moon as a god? A divine being that he will bring into this world? He the manifestation of its will? His plan was never to use Dalamut as a weapon for the Empire, but to bring about its return to the world, and he was willing to sacrifice himself to do it. He is, at this point, completely lost. The man even does the crazy RPG bad guy walk through fire. Using his new powers, he raised a long buried Allegan ruin to the heavens where he begins to pull the moon towards the surface. But he does so without the support of the empire or technology to the marvel of his men. He has done something that should be impossible. And as soldiers from the grand companies gather below, the white raven unleashes fire from the sky upon them. A way to the island must be found and once again, we turn to Sid. Sid, who has put a lot of the blame for this whole thing on himself and his family's association with the Meteor Project. Can you really say to infinity and beyond? We turn to Sid. Are you serious? Sid, who has put a lot of the blame. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear up in this bitch. <laughs> to infinity and beyond. <laughs> Falling with style. <laughs> For this whole thing on himself and the his association with the end. Project <laughs> offers to take you, the adventurer who has somehow made it this far, to the floating island to confront Nail. But when you arrive, you find someone entirely different. Dalamud has been slowly warping the mind of the Imperial for years. Didn't Alphano say the same thing when launching the Ragnarok? Probably. That's a very fitting time to have a, a callback kind of quote like that enthralling him whatever he once was he is no longer madness has consumed him and in the battle that ensues the white raven now empowered by ancient magics reaches for the heavens to finish the deed before being struck down and while the forces of Eorzea celebrate their victory in Gridania Nail's purpose had been fulfilled the red moon still descended Yet, as if a sign so that cool. hope still remains, I wish they would do that. Symbols wow. of the twelve began so to appear all around Eorzea. Louis Swa, realizing this could be a sign from the gods, encouraged the people of the realm to seek them out and pray at them. But it was, in fact, he who had secretly carved them into the stones. They were to be like spiritual anchors for the ritual that could potentially save the realm from the. 
So Louis Swa essentially studied how, how primals come to be and then figured out if I can convince the world to pray for these gods, they will become real. We will summon them or they will become real. And even though that's not what happened, he was right. Because it was us, right? It was us. It was our faith that manifested. It wasn't actually the 12, as we learn in the raid. So Luis was so gigabrain. The existence of the 12, though, inspired him to do this. That's wild, dude. The circle, the circle of, like, events is fucking crazy. The falling astral body. But it's just a little easier to say, the gods can help us, rather than, this is a last-ditch effort and I need everyone involved. And it was there, at one of the symbols, that Gaius would make his last appearance. He had seen the madness of Nail, and although he sought the conquest of Eorzea, he was no monster, he was not like that man. So he had worked against him secretly, and now would be pulling the 14th Legion back to Alamigo. But the 7th, they were completely lost to the cult of Nail Van Darnus and had chosen to remain to see their commander's dream come true. Gaius he calls you old to stop friend. Element, save Eorzea, and leave me something worth conquering. Yo, what a fire line. Holy shit, that's fucking sick. The White Raven shall realize his twisted seventh, ambition from beyond the grave. They were completely lost to the cult of Nail Van Darnus and had chosen to remain. It falls to you to prevent that from happening. Holy shit, I didn't know about this dialogue at all. Old friend. So be sure to fight with all your strength. To see their and leave me something come worth true. conquering. Gaius, <laughs> Yo, Gaius Van Belsar is so fucking awesome. He's so cool, dude. Did you to stop Dalamid, save Eorzea. That's so and cool. Maybe if you succeed, the two of you would meet again someday. Also At note how the seventh summons a meteor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The seventh legion. Mm-hmm. And so the Eorzean Alliance and adventurers from all over the realm would march to the Cardano Flats of Mordona, Dalamid rapidly approaching to buy Louis Swa time to perform his ritual and save the world. But none knew of the terror trapped inside Dalamid for thousands of years, wanting to be free. Shia's friend. This is the first thing I ever saw of Final Fantasy XIV. Honestly, I saw this cutscene before I even played the game. Because someone showed me one time, they're like, you gotta see this. I was like, okay, and I watched it and I was like, damn, dude. Final Fantasy is wicked. I mean, I know it always has been. They've always had sick cutscenes, but... When I saw this, I was like, dude. This might be one of the best cutscenes ever. In any game ever. It's like top five. Sound design here is nuts. Cool, obviously, with all the context you have about Harper and these other characters whose names I can't never remember, Lamed or whatever. These other ones. To like watch it back. It's pretty cool. All these cutscenes, really.
that I've cleared you, Cobb? This is like extra sick to me. Having gotten to fight Golden Bahamut and shit, it's pretty cool. Get Chad Louis Swap. It's pretty insane that there's just one of them at each of those. Like, Yashtola's doing that alone. I mean, I know that other people are doing it, like, not physically there. But it's pretty wild to see, like, the Scions there just fucking <laughs> invoking that much power. It's pretty, pretty sick, dude. Twelve symbols. And there probably were twelve, uh, twelve spears or whatever pushed into the globe as well. I, I never counted them. Odin, Behemoth, a crystal tower. Which looks a lot like ICC, to be honest with you. I think it's cool. I think it's a cool thing. I love this fucking song.
still gives me goosebumps. Yeah, I can't really talk during them. Final Fantasy fourteen one I get choked up. And a realm reborn. They're so sick. Begins. I'm sure there will be a lot of a great people that video. Say, uh, but what about this storyline or that storyline, Jesse? I made the executive decision that while it would have been cool to bring up some of the smaller characters and plot points, the vast majority are just reintroduced in A Realm Reborn. And the Final Fantasy XIV team does a really great job of acknowledging that most people didn't play 1.0, and at this point, no one can. So while yes, there is an alchemist quest chain that calls back to the Gubu Rampage at the start of 1.0, or a certain gentleman who takes on the moon, then makes his return. If you really want to find out those stories, go check out the many, many amazing resources out there for a deep dive. But that is it for me. Until next time, when we tackle 2.0, A Realm Reborn. Thanks for watching. Sick. Sick video. That was worth the time. It took a fucking year. It took a fucking year. <laughs> it took a literally an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, but that's okay. Hey, guess what? Now we get to play the game.